First of all, how are you enjoying Davos? Just a little quick one. Is this your first time, second time? How many times? It is my first time, and the tip on the snow boots was the best ever. <laughs> uh, and it's been fantastic for us, too. This is our third time in the Filecoin Sanctuary with CNBC, and we, it's been fantastic. Thank you, and we appreciate, obviously, uh, for, for you to help host us in this amazing space. Um, so, Commissioner, I will come to you first. Um, first of all, it's such an honor for, I think, Marta and I to have you on stage with us, and we're going to have a great conversation. So, yes, get your phones out like the friends in the, in, <laughs> right in the front. <laughs> keep going, keep going, friends. We love that. <laughs> Everyone get your cameras out because you really want to hear about how we're going to regulate crypto. Okay, so, Commissioner Pham, come to you first then. What makes you so excited about crypto technology we understand, we know, it's something that you really care about. Well, thank you so much for the question, and I really want to thank Marta and the entire Filecoin team for having me here. It's a beautiful space. The conversations that we've been having all week here have been so thought-provoking. For me, look, growing up as a kid, I was a science and technology nerd. I love hearing and thinking about the future and what it could be like and what was so striking to me about what the Filecoin Foundation is doing and what blockchain technology is possible of doing is this idea of really harnessing the crowd for compute power. And what I think is really fascinating about what Filecoin Foundation is doing and why crypto is interesting to me, and even beyond crypto, but just tokenization, period. Whether it's tokenization of financial instruments or tokenization to power utility tokens for customer engagement or for decentralized storage, all of these things to me is a vision of what the future is. And as regulators, we can't hide from the future. And I think regulators have a tendency to be reactive. You know, in my career, I've studied crises and I've responded to crises, whether it was the 90s uh, savings and loan crisis to the 2008 financial crisis and the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States and the global implementation of that or the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to future-proof our regulations. Okay, so just picking up on what you said there, you said you can't hide from the future, don't be reactive. So give us an, an overview of your approach um, to crypto regulation, please. So for me, I think as somebody who's had a compliance background in particular, clear rules of the road are absolutely critical because as a business person, getting into trouble with the law is not a very good business model. And for any business that you're in, but particularly in financial services, risk management has to be the core of your business. And so for me, it's about having regulatory clarity that helps firms achieve compliance. It actually helps to promote compliance when you know what the rules are because then you don't cross the line. And so that's why I think we need to take a pragmatic approach, really understand the use cases, have an activities-based approach, and most importantly, have a clear delineation between what are financial activities and what are commercial or non-financial activities, and make sure that we have the appropriate uh, law and regulatory frameworks, because they're different. And that distinction is important then for you? Absolutely, because if you think about it, what are other digital marketplaces? What are commercial activities? You know, sometimes people say, well, it's the internet or it's the next generation of the internet and so it's not regulated. Well, that's not true. The internet is regulated. Um, if you think about digital marketplaces, so uh, when we think about utility tokens, for example, and, and the exchange of utility tokens, Amazon and eBay are digital marketplaces. They're regulated, but they're not regulated like securities exchanges. That's just, I think, a really basic example of why there's a different legal and regulatory framework that applies. Okay. We'll come back to you in a second, Marta. It's so good to talk to you. I mean, like I said, we've been enjoying this beautiful space you've helped provide for us, but now we get to get to pick your amazing brain. So first of all, um, obviously everyone can see the word Filecoin written everywhere, but explain to us what it actually is, because I know that not everyone will know. Um, and also, I wanted to ask you, is it an example of a non-financial use case for crypto? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I think the thing about this space is there are so many financial use cases, but there are also so many non-financial use cases. And that's one of the reasons when you're thinking about regulation um, that you really have to take into account that this can't just be about financial regulation. So to give an example, um, Filecoin uh, really takes advantage of the fact that with cryptocurrency, what it really lets you do is it, it lets you write computer programs for your money. So for example, you could say, for every second of a song that I play on my computer, automatically transfer 
one one millionth of a cent from me to the songwriter and automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent from me to the singer. And that can happen instantly and automatically across the world with absolutely no intermediary in between. So what we do with Filecoin is we use that programmability to create a decentralized file storage network. You can think of it sort of like Airbnb, but for file storage. So basically people can rent out extra storage space that they have on their computer hardware, and others will rent it from them and store their files sort of chopped up and encrypted on other people's computer hardware. Um, and they will get paid for doing that in Filecoin instantly and automatically. So that might sound a little bit like a niche use case, um, but actually what it allows you to do is create a decentralized alternative to something like Amazon Web Services, right? Where today, if you were to go on any website on today's internet, almost always the data is actually being stored by either Amazon Web Services, Google, or Microsoft, right? It's just those three companies that we all live our online lives through. Um, and so we think you can create a better version of the web by uh, creating a decentralized alternative where users can really be in control of their own data and their own privacy and security. Now you use that word decentralized. I believe that you also made an exciting announcement yesterday, was it? And it was about putting decentralized technology in space. I mean, oh my God, Marta, talk to us about that then. Yeah, so um, the, the technology that Filecoin is built on top of is called IPFS, um, the Interplanetary File System. Um, so this is a decentralized uh, file storage and content system. Um, and the reason that IPFS is actually called the Interplanetary File System is that we always actually thought of it as something that could really improve long distance networking in space and make that actually more efficient. Um, and so we've been using IPFS on Earth for 10 years now, um, but we actually partnered um, and worked with Lockheed Martin over the last three years. Um, and we uh, recently announced just yesterday that we actually successfully completed a demonstration mission to show how, how IPFS can be used in space. And we sent data back and forth from Earth to a Lockheed Martin satellite using IPFS. The reason that matters um, are three reasons. The first reason is today's centralized internet model just doesn't work in space. The reason for that is that when you on today's internet look for data, like you're clicking on a link, that data is coming from a particular server in a particular location. So on Earth, that's fine. There isn't a huge delay when you go to a particular server to retrieve the data. But if you actually are in space, there's gonna be a multi-second delay if you're out on the moon, multi-minutes if you're out by Mars. The way that IPFS works is instead of looking for data in a particular location, you're actually looking for a particular content ID. And you're looking for any, like a particular piece of content and it'll pull it from wherever's closest. Um, and so that means if you already downloaded that piece of data, it'll pull it from your own device. If, you, if a lunar station nearby has it, it'll pull it from there. If an orbiting satellite has it, it'll pull it from there. So it really decreases the latency of networking in space. The second reason it matters um, is that in space, data is often corrupted by radiation, and there's also issues with space debris. That's one of the big challenges with storing data in space. So if you're looking for data in a particular location, like on today's web, and it's corrupted, that's gonna be a problem. But if you look for a particular piece of content, and it'll just pull it from wherever it's available, um, so it will ignore the corrupted files and pull it from wherever's closest that actually has it, that is much, much better. And the final reason that this really matters for networking in space um, is that it actually allows you to cryptographically verify that data hasn't been tampered with because every piece of content has a particular content ID. And if one pixel is changed, that content ID is totally different. So if you are on a satellite and taking satellite images and then you beam it back down to Earth using IPFS, you can cryptographically verify that that satellite image was never tampered with, which is very powerful. Okay, listen, I think that, that really deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Thank Come you. on, guys. That's so ridiculous right there. I mean, how exciting will that be for the average person? I mean, obviously, you're innovating right now, but how exciting could it be for just every user? 
I mean, I think fundamentally, we don't even realize how much of our lives is already being lived through the space economy, right? How much of our data is being beamed back and forth from satellites. And what we really see this as is a foundational layer of the infrastructure for the future space economy. So I don't know if users will really notice, but they'll certainly notice when there's a decrease in latency. Um, they may not know why, but we really think it's very exciting. And particularly for people who are working on building the space economy, this is something that's really exciting as a way to really build the infrastructure from the ground up in a way that's more efficient. Brilliant, and so Commissioner Camden, does, does what Mart has just said really excite you? And perhaps, um, you know, what other non-financial use cases do excite you? What are you looking at? So what Marta just described, I think, is such an, an aspirational, a dream achieved, right? They dreamed it, they achieved it. It's like something from a movie or a book, uh, like the ones I used to read when I was little. And it's sci-fi, but it's amazing to see what we as humans can accomplish, right? And the thing is, is that regu regulation shouldn't stifle innovation. It should promote responsible innovation. And actually that's part of the CFTC's mandate is that we uh, have a mandate to promote fair competition and responsible innovation. Now, I was in the public sector before. Um, I was uh, at the, the CFTC, the SEC, the OCC, which is a US bank regulator, um, came back to the CFTC. Then I went into the private sector and that experience I had in the private sector, that practical hands-on rolling up my sleeves and doing the work and working with clients who are uh, corporations, corporates and who are actually looking to serve their clients, their customers, that appreciation of the real economy and what is out there beyond just financial markets is what really informs my approach as a commissioner and which is why I have been very focused on the commercial use cases because the CFTC, as the regulator of commodity derivatives, and the commodity is basically everything, including a security, but that's reserved to the SEC, so it's another long discussion. Um, but it's the intersection of the real economy uh, people who build physical things, but also things like interest rates uh, and the financial markets. So when I was doing my global stock taking exercise as part of um, coming up with not only the agenda for my global markets advisory committee that I sponsor, but also for the proposal I made last year at the Cato Institute for a uh, first ever US regulatory sandbox for innovation for digital asset markets, I went to all these other, uh, about a dozen jurisdictions, Europe, Asia, the UK, and asked them what are they doing to facilitate innovation. I talked to finance ministries, and there's this unified industrial policy. And so depending on, like, you know, in Italy, they were very focused on some of the um, consumer and, uh, but also some of the manufacturing aspects. In Asia, of course, the, the digital economy is alive and thriving in Asia, in South Korea, um, some of the, the opportunities in GameFi. And so, these things, or even something as simple as a rewards program. All of us you know, flew here or took the train or something like that. Uh, you have rewards, miles, or points, or what have you. You can use blockchain to create direct customer engagement through those rewards programs and to trace it and to not lose it and all of those things. And that doesn't sound to me like anything financial. That's, that's the same thing as it is today. It's a rewards program. So those types of things, whether it's in media, entertainment, sports is another area where there's a lot of different activities happening. And so that's why, why when the rest of the world is moving towards what an, a digital enabled economy is, or just a purely digital economy as more and more people spend time in virtual worlds, why should we in the US hold that back by applying the wrong set of regulations to what is, again, commercial activity? going about our daily lives. And by the way, there is a US agency that's responsible for overseeing commerce and, and commercial activities and protecting consumers, and it's the Federal Trade Commission. And you've started to see some of their um, uh, more activity in the crypto space as well, which is appropriate, and I, and I support that. So let me just ask you, oh, first of all, if you've got a phone, please put it on silent. You know, you've got amazing women on stage, so please don't you know, interrupt them when they're speaking. Um, do you think people are, you know, the average person then is, is a little bit scared about embracing, as you said, um, fully embracing this digital life. And then you're also talking about, you know, regulatory sandboxes. So regulation is there to support, not to handcuff. But why do you think as well, people that are within the world of tech, they're scared of being regulated? I think it's because they're worried about being subject to the wrong set of rules. Again, let's go back to one of the examples I gave 
earlier uh, in the session. If Amazon was regulated like a securities exchange, it, it, it could not do its business, right? I, I get Amazon, I get many things. I live in Manhattan, so I, almost everything comes through ordering it on Amazon. Can you imagine, especially during COVID, what a godsend for many, many people who could not, because of laws like that were enforced or required quarantine, you know, could not actually go to the store. Or, you know, in Manhattan, there were nothing on the shelves. And so you did need to order it online. So if you think about sort of that, that innovation, right, and, and the idea that maybe if you were using Amazon points to buy something through the Amazon marketplace, and then that would be treated as a security, and then you couldn't use Amazon whatsoever, that kind of innovation is what I think we might be seeing here, and that's why I think people are very reluctant. Also, it is no joke to be investigated by the CFTC. We <laughs> levy billion dollar fines, or the SEC. Yeah. Their fines are a little bit smaller than ours. Or DOJ, right? That's, that's criminal prosecution. People, honest, responsible business people, do not want to mess with the law, and I truly believe that. And, and having been in the private sector, you look at your legal risk and you look at your reputational risk and you don't, you don't really want to take big risks there. Indeed. Well, this sort of tees up Marta really well. I mean, Marta, you wear so many hats. We all know it. Um, what for you are really the guiding principles there for crypto policy? Yeah, well, I think one thing that's really important to understand is that the cryptocurrency space is actually highly regulated. <laughs> I, think, I think it's really a, um, a misunderstanding that, that you know, cryptocurrency is, is not regulated. Um, the exchanges um, that where people are buying and selling cryptocurrency, um, they are doing KYC, they are sending reports uh, to various uh, government agencies. They're subject to all sorts of rules. Um, and I think fundamentally, there's this question when it comes to technology policy of what does it mean to regulate a technology? And my view is that the thing that should be regulated is activities, not technologies. We don't regulate the internet. We have things that are legal and illegal. Activity on the internet. Activity on the internet. And when it comes to something like, for example, fraud, right? It doesn't matter what technology you use it's just to commit illegal. fraud. It's just illegal, right? And, and similarly, you know, all of these activities that are illegal in other contexts are illegal regardless of whether you are using a pen and paper or the telephone or US dollars or cryptocurrency. Um, and so this actually is a space where you are already heavily regulated subject to many, many rules. Um, and I think that's something that is not well understood. Those mm -hmm. things apply regardless, exactly like Marta said. When money is involved, anti-money laundering, the Bank Secrecy Act, those th sanctions, those things apply no matter where you are in the world, anytime money is involved. And I think that's a great point. And so Marta then, we know that Filecoin is just one example of a cryptocurrency. What should regulators perhaps be taking into account for non-financial use cases as well? Yeah, so, you know, like the commissioner was saying, I think um, one of the things that's really important is that the right set of rules get applied, right? And so, you know, you'll often hear, for example, in the securities context, this idea of, well, why would that be a, a problem? But when it comes to something like cryptocurrency, there are these non-financial use cases and, and even financial use cases that really rely on the ability to do automatic peer-to-peer -peer transactions, Ooh. right? So just to give an example, um, with Filecoin, right, the whole point, the whole system relies on being able to say, is someone still storing that file? They are, great, automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent in Filecoin to them, right? And for that to happen instantly and automatically. That is the power of cryptocurrency. That is the reason that the technology is so powerful, is the ability to program your money. If you apply the wrong set of rules to that and you are forced to go through some sort of intermediary like a securities exchange, it breaks the whole thing. And so it's really important to keep in mind that these non-financial use cases and, and the financial use cases that rely on these peer-to-peer -peer transactions have to be regulated in a way that doesn't break the fundamental technology. Would Plus, you agree? Yeah. yeah. There's just a security like a debt or equity security is a debt or equity interest in an obligation for the equity of a company, an issuer, right? And so I just think the entire construct, it's not fit for purpose. 
you know, that, that's why I think it's really important, um, as Marta was saying, and, and actually as regulators all around the world, whether it's the Financial Stability Board or IOSCO, recognize the importance of taking an activities-based regulatory approach to not just um, the crypto space, but also when you think about uh, data or you think about any other field. And so um, in looking at it, one of the things that's sort of innovative about digital assets is, is it's, it's a thing. You know, it's a digital asset, it's, it's something. And so is it money or is it some other kind of asset? If it's another kind of asset, is it a financial asset or a non-financial asset? And only by understanding you know, what is it and what do you use it for, that's how you determine the regulatory frameworks. I actually think in the financial services space, that's actually pretty, to me, it's pretty cut and dried and boring. It's upgrading the pipes and plumbing of the financial system. It's what happened when we moved from paper to electronic records, now we might be moving to digital tokens. But this evolution is the same and, and the concerns and the risks and the regulatory framework is the same. Are there technical tweaks because of the technology and just to, to make sure? Sure, but the same risks that you're concerned about, financial risks, market risk, credit risk, operational risks, legal risk, those are all the same types of risks. And so in the financial space, look, whether you're doing banking and payments activity, whether you're doing capital raising and that could implicate the securities laws, whether you're trading some kind of derivative, like a pair of something and you're exchanging it, we know what those rules are and that's why regulators all around the world have said same activity, same risk, same regulation. But again, what I think is more exciting and, and what means more for, for my daughter, and, and by the way, my daughter is you know, doing Roblox and she's you know, spending time and, and she doesn't want her allowance in US dollars anymore, she wants Robux. <laughs> she's de-dollarized. Well, she's definitely not going to that. <laughs> exactly, right? And that's what we're talking about. What does the future look like? It's going to be more important to her how she, you know, gets a t-shirt in her game than going to the mall and buying a t-shirt at the mall. That's what I've seen so far. And, and take that and multiply it exponentially for everybody and their families and the next generation. Well, I like what you said about your daughter, but also the paper to digital um, analogy. Um, so given that, you know, just to pick up on your daughter then, the younger generations, do you think that they're embracing this more and less fearful? They don't even question it. Like this, they're, they're so digitally native. Yeah. Um, it was, I think, more difficult for all of us to go to like a work from home environment when we went remote because of the pandemic. When my daughter went remote for school, you know, there's obviously the, um, the, what you lose in the in-person -pers interaction, that's not healthy. Mm. But this idea that she was having play dates in, in a game on Roblox instead of in person. Mm. I mean, sometimes when my daughter would do play dates, it would be like the two kids sitting there with their iPads, like playing a game together, like in the same room. I'm like, but you're not, you're in the same room. Why don't you like talk to each other or play with each other? They're like, we are playing together, mm. right? And it, they just don't even think about it. It is how they're, growing up, I mean, we, we live in a world where we exist in both a physical layer and a digital layer at the same time. I go to an art museum, I'm appreciating these amazing like Dutch masters on the walls, but there's a QR code. And I scan that QR code to get more information, more context, it's a richer experience. And that's what we're living in today. And it's only gonna become more and more enhanced as technology advances and as the cost of access to that technology, having a smartphone or any other kind of device that gets invented, I think that's what we're seeing in the future. I definitely love that approach. And Commissioner, then, you know, talk to us then about your approach to regulation. It seems that it's, uh, from my understanding um, of your approach, it seems to be very holistic and, and, and proactive. Um, perhaps others argue that the best way to protect consumers is to keep cryptocurrency from being integrated um, into the economy uh, by taking the position that almost all cryptocurrencies are securities. Um, so, yeah, so tell us your opinion then. So, again, it comes back to the point of where there are laws and regulations, mm. but which are the ones that apply to the activity that you're doing? Um, there's actually been a lot of coverage and headlines lately about, coming back to my example, about like mileage rewards programs around what are the airlines doing with their mileage rewards programs and are consumers being protected? Are there fair disclosures? Do they understand how the program works and are rules being changed unfairly? To me, if I'm, and we're all very familiar with this, you know, I can take my airline miles and then like go buy gift cards or go buy a Bluetooth uh, speaker or something like that, right? We're familiar with that. So this idea that um, the only kind of regulation that protects the public is financial regulation is false, clearly false, right? And so we just need to understand 
what are the, uh, what is the commercial activity? When I go and buy a car, okay, I can't get scammed when I buy a car. And, you know, I can't get scammed when I'm buying this or that. And so I just think it's really important that we find the right set of regulations. And there's a lot of regulations. There's commercial, there's trade, there's IP, mm -hmm. there's data. There's a lot of laws that are out there as we go about our daily lives. And it's, again, not financial regulation. So I just really think making that clear. And then again, to this point that was made, and I can't emphasize it enough, it's what your parents told you. Don't lie, don't cheat, <laughs> don't steal. Don't you, steal. you can't do don't that. It doesn't it. matter where or what you're doing, you can't yes. do that. Well, you definitely seem like a bit of a global citizen. I mean, every time you say, you, you, you know, you talk about your travel, you talk about all the different places that you visit. So, um, in, you know, as a regulator then, in your other hat, um, all these different um, areas, that you, different uh, jurisdictions um, that you've traveled to, I mean, what can, have you learned then, perhaps, from the other countries, the different jurisdictions then? These, these are some great learnings. And I think that's one of the things that I've been very fortunate to have is uh, that in my private sector career, you know, I was a, an executive, I was a global head at a um, large global financial institution. And every day, particularly when I had roles in legal and compliance and regulatory, I needed to understand what are the US laws and regulations that we are subject to no matter where we are in the world, but what are also the local or home country regulations for what jurisdiction we're operating in, uh, where we're doing business with clients, whether it's again in, in the UK or in Europe or in Asia or in LATAM. So having that appreciation and understanding that you do have to take a holistic approach, you need to understand how everything fits together. What I've observed in my travels is um, some key things, particularly when I was trying to to you know, come up with what would a US regulatory sandbox look like. Mm -hmm. First of all, in order to promote and facilitate innovation, you need to have political stability. You need to have the rule of law. And you need to have regulatory clarity. And that's why, as a regulator, I just feel so strongly that it's incumbent upon us to do our part and to make sure that there is that regulatory clarity. So not only are these the three key ingredients that you have to have in order to promote innovation, I think that there are other jurisdictions which are smaller and more nimble. They're able to move more quickly than the United States. And they're taking a unified approach to their industrial policy, where not only are they providing funding for some of these like great startups or, or um, developing critical technologies, but they are taking a very practical approach. Um, I'll give you another example. Many other jurisdictions in looking at uh, crypto uh, assets have already come up with definitions of a utility token. So these, it's not even a question. They already have a definition for it. Um, I see some uh, audience members who are from Liechtenstein and drafted the law there that registered uh, and created uh, token businesses We'd and like has a your hands up if you did that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's brand at the front again. Okay. And I went to Liechtenstein to learn about how they have regulated and overseen and examined the businesses, not just financial services, but other businesses using tokens. And so, anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that they've taken a pragmatic approach. They've gone and they've been doing it. This is already happening all around the world. There's a definition for yield utility token, and I think that would really move the needle in the United States if we also came up with a definition of utility token. Maybe let's shift the conversation. We keep talking about what is the security, what is the commodity. Maybe that's not actually the conversation we need to be having. Maybe we need to say, what is commercial activity? What is utility token? What is something that's just like exchanging points or miles or what have you? And how does that enable the growth of the economy, the real economy? Okay, so Marta, the Commission has really set out some very clear key ingredients that she thinks are really important. Um, but there are, of course, misconceptions, massive misconceptions when it comes to cryptocurrency that perhaps influence policymakers and regulators to then not provide clear rules. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think everything that the Commissioner has said is so on point. It is very difficult for businesses that are in cryptocurrency or digital assets to operate in the United States right now. It is very difficult because of the lack of clarity around this idea of utility, around when uh, cryptocurrency is a security and when it is a commodity. Um, and, and this is something that is, is 
has gotten um, much more acute over the last year. But I think it's I think it's absolutely critical um, that that we have clarity on that mm -hmm. issue. Um, there has been some movement in Congress on that. Um, the, there was a fantastic bill that passed out of the House Financial Services Committee um, that that really would go a long way in providing that clarity. But without that clarity, it's very difficult to operate at the moment, um, and that is something that. I think is desperately needed in the United States. And I think it's fantastic that other countries have made it much easier to operate there by being very clear about what the rules of the road are and making it very clear when a cryptocurrency is uh, uh, utility as opposed to being regulated like a security. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that people talk about, oh, is the US falling behind, falling behind in crypto. I don't think we should think about it being about crypto. It's just about technology and the digital economy. So again, in jurisdictions like Japan, where they have a clear regulatory framework around this, they are developing and accelerating the digital economy. And that's something that impacts all sectors, financial, commercial, consumer, food, production, manufacturing, I mean, you name it. It's just using this technology, using digital. It's like the conversation we have about AI. AI is not a thing in and of itself. It's a tool mm. to enhance productivity, as, as all technology. And so that's what I'm worried about, is what does this mean for holding up the digital economy, for uh, enhancing the effectiveness and the reach and the access uh, for companies, for consumers, for global citizens, for anybody? I feel like I want to sit you in a room with people that really don't want to embrace technology because you speak about it so clearly. Um, but let me just also ask, you mentioned also, um, you know, that there's some criticism that, you know, the US isn't moving as fast as other parts of the world, but there is some movement as well on the policy and regulatory front as well, isn't there? On the regulatory front. Yeah. So what I think is um, that, you know, we could see what happens. Uh, Congress makes the laws and I execute them. So my job is when Congress sets out a mandate, it's my job to carry that out, to enforce it, to implement it. But you know, we'll see what happens. But even in the absence of legislation, there are things that regulators can do. So in the past, I've said that if you think about it from the US regulatory perspective, and, and it is kind of a unique system, um, regulators have three main authorities or powers. There's the power to inspect or examine, to request information. Uh, I spent many, many, many hours and years responding to information requests from regulators all over the world. <laughs> uh, thousands of pages. There's, and, and I don't know how many gigabytes of data. Um, there's the power to enforce, which is self-explanatory. And there's the power to regulate. These are very broad authorities, particularly in the US system, because it is hard to pass legislation. Um, because it's so important. And so that's why, generally speaking, we have legislation that passes these regulatory frameworks, but then it's up to the agencies that have the technical expertise to actually issue the rules that implement them. So how could, just, just a quick follow-up then before I move to Martin, I'm quite aware there's less than five minutes. I want to get all of your, uh, both of your final thoughts. And um, you know, how do you think crypto could really be incorporated into the regulatory landscape then? So in the US, uh, what I think is very promising, I feel like I read maybe a couple months ago that the Department of Commerce was actually putting together a task force to look at the use of enterprise blockchain technology across all different sectors. Uh, look at decentralization, look at what tokenization can do. That's an important and, and great first step. I think that the executive order with the report on digital assets, that was also last year and was a whole of government approach and looked at every agency and their jurisdiction and um, what they might need to do. And particularly for just fundamental science and technology and research and development. The thing is, is that doesn't catch the headlines. That's not really capturing public opinion. People aren't talking about it in a day-to-day -day, uh, as they go about things the way that it is in other countries, where it's just sort of, yes, of course, this is something new and let's regulate it and then let's move on. And so, Marta, then, what's the risk of delaying legislation? What would you say? I mean, I think when it comes to uh, regulation and legislation, um, the lack of a very clear definition of when something is a security and when it's not um, is unfortunately making it 
almost impossible to do business in the United States. And so I think for the US, this is a pretty critical problem. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, there's a different ways to approach it. Um, there's regulatory clarity from regulators as one, as one approach. There's the legislation that we're seeing moving through Congress. And there are the battles that are happening in the court right now um, about when cryptocurrencies are securities and when they're commodities. Um, so there's, there's multiple ways to address it, but I think the clarity is absolutely critical. Um, um, and very time sensitive for allowing innovation to continue to thrive in the US. Okay, now we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, what I'd really like to do is, instead of me asking you a final question, do either of you have a question? I mean, you're both amazing individuals um, in your own right. Do you have a question for the other? Would you like to ask it? What's next after space? Oh my is God. space the final frontier? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there is, I have to tell you, I, uh, the demonstration mission, I will say this, this our, our mission in space is not done. We really have just begun. And you know, it's funny because things in space really move a lot slower than things move, you know, doing, working on technology in space moves much slower than uh, in the cryptocurrency world. So we've been working for a few years on getting this demonstration mission and actually deploying IPFS in space, um, you know, writing an implementation of IPFS that is, is compatible with space. Um, but, you know, this is really just the beginning. I think we're going to be working on continuing to deploy IPFS in space for a very, very long time. Um, and we also actually have um, for very similar reasons to why this technology is so useful in space. There are a lot of other applications. Um, for example, this technology was recently announced to be uh, being used by the Navy. Um, so yes. uh, other examples of where this technology it can be really critical for sort of the future of how we do networking in a way that's much better than today's centralized model. I was actually going to say that I think oceans are our final frontier. So uh, the Navy, uh, that makes perfect sense. I think um, this is such an example and actually from a regulatory standpoint yeah. of, well, you just be, take a very serious note really quickly, of why, as Marta was talking about the space economy, and we're talking about IPFS, which is a protocol that could be used for communications in space, other nations are also in the space race and developing their capabilities. It's a national security issue as well, and how fortunate for the United States that it is a US-led consortium, foundation, what have you, that is developing this protocol for communications in space. What is that gonna mean for the next level? And so we don't have time to get into a national security conversation, but it's another reason why it's important we get it right. Indeed. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to ask each other, just quickly? Yes, I would love, <laughs> I would love to hear from you, Commissioner, on really what your advice is for the uh, companies that are working on these new emerging technologies, like cryptocurrency, like Filecoin. You know, what your advice is for us um, to navigate this very, very difficult, at the moment, regulatory environment? Mm -hmm. So I can't give advice to anybody, but um, when you think about what's outside the United States and what's in the United States is two very different approaches. Outside the United States, I think that the, the dialogue between subject matter experts in the industry and technical experts uh, at regulatory agencies is very straightforward, it's very pragmatic. There are amazing projects being done under the BIS Innovation Hub uh, system and those are just straightforward, it's pragmatic, it's, it's like let's get right down to it. In the United States, unfortunately, it's become a very emotional, conversation, it's, it's almost been framed as this battle between good and evil. And maybe to paraphrase what somebody else has said, I don't think technology is evil, but maybe evil technology, evil people can use technology to do evil things, right? And so we need to get away from this emotional conversation in the United States and just be like, what is it? And, and what is it for and what are we doing? And let's not ascribe all of these things to a technology. You know, I, I think that's what's one of the big challenges is. Um, besides that, the only other thing I would say, which is the same thing when I was in the private sector, is you should have a really good securities lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, the note I've made here is limitless ideas and possibilities. I mean, honestly, this has been such a fascinating conversation. I feel like I've learned so much from both of you. And just to hear, especially your passion for it, your passion for everything that you do as well, it's just so amazing. So please, guys, be upstanding for the Commissioner and Madame Présidente. <laughs> <laughs>